I said, I'm Derek Sayers, um, Head of um, Construction, Health and Safety for the Suite Group. We're one of the top um, five construction um, consultants in the UK. Um, and I'm here today to talk about the new CDM regulations that came into force um, back in the beginning of April. Um, these regulations came into play on the, the beginning of April. By the way, feel free to answer any, ask any questions while I'm going through, because there's quite a lot to take on board, or we'll take questions at the end. Um, these regulations came into force on the 6th of April 2015. Um, there was some doubt whether they would come into force because of the, uh, it, they introduced domestic clients into the remit, and also it's just before the general election. But the regulations did actually come into force, and apart from the industry, they've come in quite quietly. Um, you probably know why we have the CDM regulations, I'm joking here. Uh, there was an EEC directive, the Temporary Mobile Construction Sites Directive. Uh, that's, that came into force in 1994, and that is the reason why we have the CDM regulations. It, it UK took these regulations, made them um, into the CDM regulations, and made them much more detailed than they do in the rest of Europe, as you can imagine. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't comply with domestic clients, and so that's one of the reasons why we've had to change the regulations. Uh, other problem is, is the, um, the Temporary Mobile Construction Sites Directive is up for review in a couple of years' time, so all these regulations you now get to know about could all possibly change again fairly soon. So the HSE have published L-Series guidance on the legal requirements of the CDM regulations. It's a document um, that is readily downloadable. That's the document there. You can go into the APS, Association of Project Safety, the CITB, or I believe the HSC, and you can download that document quite easily. Um, it's got in italics are the guidance to the regulations, and in bold, no, it's the other way around, in, in bold are the action, guidance to the regulations and in italics are the actual regulations themselves. So it's a document, it's quite an easy document to read and um, it will tell you all about the regulations. So in addition to this, the CIT have published industry guidance for the five named duty holders plus guidance for workers. So you've got industry guidance for clients, um, they're quite slim documents, they're only 20 pages, they're quite easy to follow. So there's industry guidance for clients, industry guidance for the principal designer. I'll explain what all these, du their duties of all these people have in a minute. Industry guidance for designers, principal contractor, contractors, and then there's guidance for workers. Workers are also named, although they don't have duties under these regulations. And that's the suite of documents there. They're all downloadable from the CITB, APS again, or the HSE. Um, quite easy, it depends what your interest is, but they're quite easily downloadable and quite easy to follow. So why are we, did we have new regulations? Um, the HSC put out a consultation document on these regulations about a year ago and um, asked people to comment. The, the comments were returned about 40% of the people who replied were CDM coordinators, so they said they don't, they, they've got an invested interest in it, so we'll forget about what they've said. Um, about 40% of the people were from the entertainment industry, uh, who for some reason had a, an axe to grind, so they said they don't count, so we'll forget about them. So there was about 20% of the people left, and they said, oh yes, so it's unanimously voted, everyone's in favour of it, so we'll bring the new regulations in. Um, the, and yes, yeah, so, so then, the main reason for doing it is domestic clients. Domestic clients are now covered by the CDM regulations. Previously, they weren't covered by previous versions and apparently are not unsure of the working of it, but um, UK was being fined by Europe because we didn't comply with the, didn't include domestic clients and the UK was being fined. So they had to bring in these new regulations to, um, to make sure that domestic clients are now covered by the regulations. They wanted to make the regulations simpler to use, so the actual L-series guidance, which I mentioned to you earlier on, is probably about the same to use as the older version. And the guidance documents, the, the guidance for the five duty holders plus the workers, are actually quite simple to use, quite straightforward, do explain what everyone's duties are. The other problem with the regulations, they are set up for, or I feel they're set up for a brand new building on a greenfield site um, following a traditional procurement route. They're not suitable for um, work in an occupied building like this 
occupied premises, refurbishment projects. So you have to adapt them to try and suit the circumstances that you're working in. But they're really designed around a brand new uh, building. They wanted to reduce the need for detailed competence assessments. Under the old regulations, you had, um, there was an approved code of practice and there was guidance on what you had to do to assess competence. And it was very detailed guidance. And a lot of people have been spent a lot of time filling out questionnaires. If you're a contractor or a designer, you know you keep getting questionnaires to fill out and you keep getting very, very similar questions always asked in a slightly different way. Um, and they want to try and avoid that. Um, I personally don't think it's going to make a blind bit of difference because these questionnaires are generated by procurement teams and they're not generated, haven't been generated by the CDM coordinator. So I think there's still going to be the requirement to fill out detailed competence assessments. So I can't see that making any difference. The other thing between, behind these regulations, they actually, when they worked out an impact assessment, they worked out the cost. And they said like an architectural practice would take about three hours training to learn the new regulations at £20 an hour. So it's going to cost about £60, an hour, £60 for someone to be retrained to learn the new regulations, which is, was quite flawed. Um, they want to make sure that CDM is further embedded in the, pro the project team. So they want to make sure that CDM and health and safety is looked at much earlier in the design process. Um, the, it should have been under the old regulations and a lot of schemes it has been looked at. They want to make sure that from day one health and safety is looked at. Um, they, what does happen though on a few schemes, the, it all gets designed they're ready to get to site and then they used to appoint someone to look at health and safety so it's mo they were appointed much too late so they're trying to encourage someone to be appointed much more earlier in the process to look at health and safety much earlier on in the project and they want so that that's basically the same thing they want to make sure that management of health and safety commences earlier in the design process so people are looking at health and safety from day one so the transitional arrangements the regulations did come in on the 6th of april if you have a project that is going to be either, is, well, if it's continuing past um, the 6th of October, there's a six-month transitional period from the re date the regulation come in. If the project's going to continue past the 6th of October and you have a CDM coordinator, that CDM coordinator has to be, appointment has to be terminated and you have to appoint a principal designer in their place. And I'll explain what the principal designer is in a minute. So if the project's going past October, you have to cancel the CDM coordinator and appoint a principal designer. If the project is finishing before the 6th of October and there's a CDM coordinator appointed, you don't have to do anything. For any new project coming up since the 6th of April, you go straight into a principal designer appointment. You don't, there's no longer a CDM coordinator appointed. You have to appoint a principal designer. So that's basically it. You're going to follow through the principal designer. So the main changes of these regulations um, CDM coordinator is replaced by that of the principal designer, but what you have to be careful of, um, I don't know how many get involved with CDM coordinators, but um, some of the CDM coordinator duties that were carried out under the old regulations aren't carried out by the principal designer. They're not automatically transferred to the principal designer. They now sit with the client, so the client has additional duties under these regulations and the client has more duties. As I said before, domestic clients are now covered by these regulations, so domestic clients are now covered by CDM. And basically, all projects are covered by CDM. There is no, it, previously people thought of it was, if it came under, if it wasn't notifiable to the HSE, it wasn't covered by CDM. That doesn't apply anymore. Every single project is covered by CDM. You then have to decide whether you, it, it's notifiable to the HSE. And there is an increase in the client's obligations. The approved code of practice that was covered by the CDM regulations, um, that was the previous version of the regulation, is now replaced by L series guidance. So that document is legal guidance. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but it doesn't hold the same weight as um, the approved code of practice. It is guidance, legal guidance that you should be following, but it isn't, uh, doesn't hold the same legal weight as an approved code of practice. Uh, they say there's a slim of a, a approved code of practice to follow, but I haven't seen a sign of it yet, and there's, I, I'm not aware that it's coming through. The projects requiring an HSE notification have changed. Um, they're trying to... Previously, you had to send a notification to the HSE as soon as you 
you knew about a project. That has changed. In fact, we found out yesterday, if you can't actually don't know who the principal contractor is, you can't put the notification in and you have to delay it till you're aware of when the, what the, whole, the whole design team is or the whole project team is, the client, the principal contractor and um, designers. And they, the notification has to be made as soon as possible, but it doesn't have to be made at, right at the start. Can I just say, you said we could ask questions. As well. Yeah, yeah. Specifically with this domestic situation, as opposed to what I do, um, <coughs> you may not know what you know, that contractor is till a year, or a long, long way down the line from when you start. So there's no need to um, notify the HSC until the the thing that I will come to. You really have to forget the notification. That you, 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 are you as a client or is you a build contractor or what are you doing? Designer. Designer. So the, the, the project has to comply, no matter what value it is, it has to comply with CDM. You now have to appoint, and I'll explain it in a minute, a principal contractor. They have to have a construction phase plan in place and you have to have someone as a principal designer. You then decide later on whether you are going to have, whether the project needs notification to the HSE. And you only then notify the HSC once you know who the principal designer is, who the client is, and who the principal contractor is. Right. So you sit alongside. And the other requirement for the notifications, I only found out um, through the consultation process that the HSC don't actually use these notifications. They, they, they never use them. They, if they go to a site to do an investigation or they do a site visit, they ask for the, the notification, but they don't sift through them. I thought they sifted through them, automatically generated a certain number of sites and decided to visit them, but they don't do that, apparently. Uh, so they're going to have thousands and thousands more than they ever had now, right? No, no. They're going to have far fewer notifications because the notification, the, there's, the projects covered by CDM have increased. But the requirement to notify the HSE has gone up. You don't have to notify the, FI, the HSE. If you see this, you, you have to notify the HSE if the project is going to last for 30 days in duration, 30 working days in duration, and more than 20 people on site at any one time. So you don't have to notify the HSE if it's only 30 days in duration and you only have 10 people on site at any one time. You don't have to notify the HSE. So that requirement, and the requirement to notify the HSE has gone up. But then, you have to notify the HSC if the project is going to exceed 500 person days. So if you do a quick sum, um, there's loads of alternatives you can do. You can have something like if you're on site for three months and had about 10 people on site, you'd be getting into the 500 person days. But if, if it's going to exceed 500 person days in duration, you notify the HSC. Yeah, well, that's most jobs in my opinion. It will be, well, may, maybe, yeah, I don't know. But uh, What you're saying is they don't look at those notifications? No, but they will ask to see it if they come to site. So they don't, they don't sift through them, but if there was an accident or if they visited site, they decided they, were, they, 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 don't, they, don't generate which, they don't generate the sites to visit by the notification, apparently. Right. The notification, and they, they don't generate it from that, but they will do random checks. They will go around sites and they will ask to see the notification then. And it's probably a, it's, it's a legal thing. So mm. they, there was a problem. Uh, they'd use that as a, as a yeah. basis to so prosecute should, a client. Or, so to be, to be safe, you just notify every project? I think um, most of the clients I talk to are still being safe and want to know, unless it's very small duration, will continue to notify the HSC. Because mm. the other thing it said... Oh, no, sorry. Here. So the competence requirements have changed. As I say, there used to be very detailed competence requirements. Um, you probably need a master's degree to fill it out and complete it all. Um, but now they're trying to encourage the, the use of um, standard assessment schemes like SSIP, CHAS, Safe Contractor, various assessment schemes to, and the, the requirement is to deliver a health and safety project and have the correct skills, knowledge and experience to do this. They're not trying to encourage um, they're trying to encourage people, to, it's the right health and safety knowledge and skills to do the job and that could be assessed by 
being on a, 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 comp a, a recognized scheme. It doesn't have to fill out a detailed questionnaire showing all the health and safety policies and all the other information. The other thing about competence requirements is, is choosing the right person to do the job. If you had a painter and decorator and you got him to carry out a demolition of a building, they probably haven't got the skills, knowledge and experience to do it. So it is, it is using someone who's got the right skills and knowledge to do the job you're asking them to do. But it is health and safety skills and knowledge and they've got to have the experience to do it. A construction phase plan is now required for all projects that fall under CDM. So every project now, whether it's for domestic clients, whether it's your small, um, very small refurbishment project, every single construction project has to have a construction phase plan. Whereas you only used to have those for projects that were notifiable to the HSC either more than 30 days in duration, Every single project have to has, has to has a construction phase plan. You have to appoint a principal contractor and you have to have a principal designer. So that is, is quite major implications, especially for people who've got, who like, I've done quite a lot of work for hospitals and universities where they've got a whole raft of work being carried out on a day-to-day -day basis. In theory, all of the projects they're now carrying out have to have a construction phase plan. And for the domestic clients, they have to have a construction phase plan. And what is that? A construction phase plan, quite, it's defined, you can download a version of it, it's a plan produced by the principal contractor um, setting out, I'll come to the principal contractor's duties in a minute, setting out how they plan to manage the project safely. So the, the, that was always required for projects that were notifiable, it now extends to all construction projects. And they're quite, as I say, there's implications for domestic clients and there's implications for, um, sorry, this is just... So it's, it's, it's quite an increase in responsibilities on the smaller projects and domestic clients. So the client, the client's duties, the CDM recognises the importance the client has to pay in the health and safety process. They did have similar duties under CDM 2007, but it is reinforcing those duties. So the client can't just set up a project, give it to his designers and to the um, and to the contractor and say get on with it. The client has responsibilities to set out how safety and health and safety is going to be managed and to monitor health and safety on a project. So the client has to ensure that each construction project is set up so it is adequately carried out from start to finish that in a way that adequately controls risks to health and safety of those that might be affected by it. So the client has responsibilities <coughs> in terms of health and safety. It doesn't say you have to carry out audits, but you've got to keep an eye on what's going on. You have to ask questions, you have to make sure that health and safety is being properly managed, um, that people are doing the jobs they're supposed to be doing. Most clients have got absolutely no idea about that. No. Nope. Yeah. yeah. I, I, when, when it comes to these regulations, I don't, um, I don't agree with them. Yeah. I'm telling you what they say. Yeah, fair, fair uh, and, and, and what you're supposed to do. Bring a bit of experience to how to yeah. fulfill the requirement without getting yeah. lost in the you, you, It's not, we, we're going around and without knowing what you do, do too much, we're going, I've gone to the hospitals and universities and they do have a whole raft of work that is now covered, um, which wasn't previously covered and we've been advising them on ways to address it. I mean they can, it can be there are construction phase plans. It's not a construction phase plan doesn't have to be a massive document. It can be a three or four page document, but it is more than a method statement. But if someone, if you're doing work in a, a building, it's fairly, I mean, if you were say, taking out the steel columns, I was looking at something the other day, putting new columns in here, you'd want to get the contractor to produce a method statement saying how he's going to manage that work safely. Well, you, now you've got to appoint the principal contractor. So it's slightly more detailed than a method statement. It's saying the management process and various other issues that the prince that has to happen. It's not a lengthy document, but, uh, it is for protection of the client at the end of the day because if, if there was an accident, the, the HSE would come along and say, how did you know this contractor was competent to do the work? They would ask that question. Then they would say, did you issue them with information on potential hazards? That would be the pre-construction information. That would be asbestos, services, other issues. And then they would say, was there a construction phase plan in place saying how they're going to carry out the work safely? And they, they would ask those questions. And if you hadn't, didn't have those documents in place, then potentially you're at risk. It's my understanding that, uh, I know you're going to come on to it in a minute, but 
on a sm small little project I want to do around here all the time. Um, by default, the designer, because there is only one on a small project usually, is, um, is the principal designer and has a responsibility to inform the client and explain to them of all their duties and make sure they understand it. Uh, the designer, not less, not, 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 the designer. the designer has an obligation, I go to the designer's obligations in a minute, but the designer has an obligation to advise the client of their CDM regulations and tell them what the CDM regulations, that CDM regulations apply to their project. Yeah, make sure they understand and, it and make sure they know yeah, how to... Yeah, there are briefing documents out there that are in place and then most guys uh, just the, throw their hands up yeah. and they go, what the hell's that? Well, know. Yeah. Are, you t are you talking primarily like domestic right yeah. now? Yeah, well, this yeah. is what yeah. the new yeah. regulations yeah. suddenly capture. Well, that's yeah. right. And, and yes, you're right. I mean, domestic crimes don't have any particular legal obligations. So, so if the onus does fall on yeah, totally. a designer or if there's a yeah. designer, the contractor or the principal contractor, if there's more than one contractor involved. So, yes, it's an issue because... It's a huge issue as because, well. Because, yeah. because certain designers and certain contractors aren't going to have much of an idea about this, and this is where it's going to be a problem. And this is where they're going to need a lot of help. Yeah, and then you've yeah. got to charge them for it as well. Well, In theory, yeah. And that's, that's why I didn't think these regulations would come in, because they're going to cost domestic clients money. Um, and, but as Graham said, I, I, I'm, I haven't, the domestic client market, I haven't read the regulations, what they say in so much detail, but the, basically they say that the con principal contractor takes on the client duties. Um, so the principal contractor is taking on the client duties. So the principal contractor should be... Um, making sure that everything complies and produces a construction phase plan because they recognise the domestic client ha is naive in terms of health and safety. Exactly, so all this stuff that the client has to know, actually they kind of don't have to know. No. They don't have to know but the people working for them have to know it. Yeah. So the yeah. contractors or the people who, the builder who'd build the house extension, in theory he should know about it and he should be advising their client and he should be producing the documentation. Yeah. And I, but I think what's going to, what's going to happen... Way down, he can come on board way down the, uh, the, the scale. Well, he will come on board before work starts. Yeah. Well, but what's going to happen, there's going to be a standard generic documents produced by people, um, Federation Master Builders or someone like that, or the CITB have got documents. Gonna, there's going to be a standard raft of documents produced which people will just fill in gaps. Um, and so I think it's going to be a watering down, basically, it's because it's going to be a... Website there is. Is there one on the HSE? I don't know about the HSE, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So it's it's going to be. This, I think there's going to be a watering down of the regular uh, of it because people are just going to fill in the name of the site, and and that's going to be basically it. So it's going to be a very simple document. Um, the again, this is set up for what I would call fairly la large projects, but. The client is supposed to set up a client brief for each of his projects. Every project he does, he's supposed to set up a client brief. And the brief is supposed to set out the function operation of the building, the motivation for initiating the project, explain design direction, establish single point of contact for client queries, set realistic time frames, set out safety goals. That sounds a fairly onerous document, but I would expect it to be a standard document. Again, and I don't think anyone would be prosecuted for not having this document in place, but the idea behind it is a client wants a brand new hospital built. Um, they set down what they want to achieve in that hospital, the health and safety goals, and that, that would then go out to the designers to price for the scheme, and would, that would follow through the con any contractors or various other people tendering for the scheme would have that set of goals, and those goals would move through the project and then be passed on to the principal contractor at the end of the day. So it's a set of client goals. Um, the client has to make suitable arrangements to ensure the project is properly managed through both design and construction phases. So the client can't just walk away, maybe forget your domestic clients for the time being, but they've got to be aware of what's going on there. It is a monitoring, it's not carrying out site inspections, it's a monitoring. So during the design process you'd make sure that health and safety is on the agenda, You'd be asking the principal designer, what have you done to discharge your obligations? During the construction phase, you'd be asking, have you had independent health site, inspection, site safety inspections carried out? Were there any accidents? At the regular monthly meetings, you would ask, is health and safety on the agenda? Um, and you, if the team changed, if the contractor changed his team, or you were aware that things like um, emergency calls, um, 
arrangements changed, you would be expecting to ask the contractor to make sure they update their documentation they produce. So it is a monitoring. You can't just forget about the con contract and let them get on with it. You've got to make sure that health and safety is being properly managed and clients have been prosecuted for not doing so. Uh, the principal designer and principal contractor have to be appointed in writing. Otherwise, the clients deem to be carrying out those duties. So if they don't appoint anyone to be the principal designer or the principal contractor, then the client takes on those obligations. But that doesn't apply to, to the No, it doesn't. No. no. It says we take it on by default. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Okay. The client has to make sure that those appointed have the necessary skills and knowledge to deliver the project in a way that secures health and safety. So you've got to make sure that all those people you're point have the skills and knowledge, health and safety skills and knowledge to deliver the project in a way that secures health and safety. Um, that again is asking for qualifications. They've tried to discourage PQQ but you make sure they've got a CHAS registration, safe contractor, member of a recognised body. You've got to appoint the people that uh, are competent to do a job in terms of health and safety. The client has to ensure that suitable pre-construction information is produced and passed to those who might need it. So clients have to obtain that information. Um, they have to make sure that information is being obtained and passed to those who might need it. You'll come to, in a minute. The principal designer is the one responsible for complying that, compiling that information. But the pre-construction information has to be produced and passed to those who might need it. So that is really also you could argue it's got to be passed to the designers and it could be passed to the principal contractor. It's all issues regarding you know rules, risks particularly asbestos, life services, contamination, if you're working in a hospital, any issues that you might come across in terms of needles or sharps or anything like that, site rules, everything has got to be put into a document and passed to those who might need it. The client is now responsible for sending the notification to the HSE. So the whereas before the CDM coordinator used to notify the HSE, now it's a client responsibility to notify the HSE. And you, if you, do it, you can do it online quite easily, um, but the client can get someone else to do it on their behalf. Uh, it, but it doesn't automatically fall within the duties of the principal designer. It used to fall within the duties of the CDM coordinator, but there's not a CDM coordinator anymore. So um, you either have to do it yourselves, or clients have to do it themselves, or they have to make sure that um, the, someone else is doing it on their behalf. They've got to take measures to ensure the principal designers carrying out their duties and where there is more than one contractor on the site, appoint one company to be the principal contractor. So if you have a contractor, a general works contractor, and he employs an electrician, say, then that is, you have to appoint one of them as principal contractor. Um, people get hung up on this principal contractor idea, but it's quite, it isn't, it's quite obvious, really. You walk into an area and you need to know who's in charge of health and safety on that, in that area. Um, you, 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 if you're in this room, building work going on in this room, you walk in here, you need to know who is in charge of health and safety in this area. That responsibility can pass from person to person. It can pass from company to company. You could have someone doing a strip out, someone else doing the fit out, um, someone else do the building works. Or you have two people working side by side, providing they're totally segregated. But it has to be quite clear and it's quite you know, this, this idea is, is that there's one person who is responsible for health and safety. It shouldn't be clouded by, oh, I've got an IT team working here or something like that. It is one company responsible. And that company has to be appointed by, as a principal contractor. And that company has to be appointed in writing. So the client shouldn't allow construction to commence. This is very similar to the old regulations, but it does actually... Um, get it used to be the CDM coordinator used to advise the client but now the client has to do it on their own or make sure or put, ask someone else to do it but basically the client shouldn't allow work to start until a relevant construction phase plan is in place so they have to make that construction phase plan setting out how the works carried out safely it's not just a method statement it is a construction phase plan it can be appropriate to the size of the project and there is guidance on what should be in that construction phase plan, but a construction phase plan is now required for every single project. That used to apply to projects that were not, that were notifiable under the old regulations. Now it applies to every single project, and the client shouldn't allow work, allow work to start until 
there, there is a, a construction phase plan in place that is relevant, not just a generic document. And it also has to set out how health and safety, will be, uh, how toilet and welfare facilities are to be provided. So all the workmen have are allowed access to compliant toilet and welfare facilities, so the contractor's got to consider how are you going to give access to those facilities and set that out in their plan. I and mean, it could be a, a, a standalone facility or it could be use of existing facilities in a building, but they have to, the work, they have to identify how, um, how the workforce is going to have access to compliant toilet and welfare facilities for the duration of their work. So it's for the whole duration, not just the, the start, uh, or, or not just the key period of the construction, it's right from the start to the finish and they have to have access to those facilities. And they have to ensure a health and safety is file is provided on completion. That's not their duty to comply it. So the principal designer, um, this is the new position under the new regulations. It wasn't in the old regulations. Um, the principal designers assumes many of the responsibilities of the CDM coordinator under CDM 2007. And, but some of those duties don't pass over to the principal designer and they sit, they go back to the client. Um, but they want to make sure that health and safety is fully integrated into the design team and is embedded skill and looked at much earlier in the design process. So really, on day one, people should be looking at health and safety and the principal designer should be carrying out that role and coordinating the health and safety aspects of the scheme. Can you still even though you're by default on a single designer project with a principal designer, can you still have a client appoint an old-fashioned CDN coordinator? Is I'll come to point in that? I'll come to it. What the, the duties of the principal designer are very, very similar to the CDM coordinator. It's coordinating health and safety. But unfortunately, now the CDM coordinator, the, the person doing the role also has to be a designer. So they've got to have the very similar jobs to the CDM coordinator, but they also have to be a designer. But you can employ a company to do, do it, not who's got design knowledge in the company. But they have to be, so it's, they, they, you, can't, you can't automatically say to your designer, we want you to take on the principal designer job, because if you haven't got health and safety knowledge and skills, you can't do it. If you can't say to the CDM coordinator, I want you to do it, to do this job, because if they're not designers, they can't do it. And the trouble is, it's also a new discipline, and so no one's got a track record. But, um, and also going through, as far as I understand it, most designers don't have health and safety skills and training. Um, it's right. not part of the learning of the, the, the role. They, most designers don't want to do it, um, and most, a lot of them can't get PI insurance for it. Well, so I talked to my PI people the other day, and they're just, they're not changing fees or anything. They're, they're saying they're reactive and not proactive. They're keeping the fees the same. Sent me an email saying there's no problem with it. We'll see what happens. Mm. If you start to get sued for it, then uh, mm. we might change our mind. So they're quite happy for you to do the principal designer role? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I don't, I, I've got, I was told they can't do it, but I mean, as, as far as we're concerned, we had the same thing. We, we asked our PI insurance, could we do the carry out the new role? And um, they just basically said it's, it's such a small part of the turnover that they're, they're quite happy for us to carry out, out that and, and be incorporated as part of our existing policy, so but they weren't concerned. If you're, if you're not happy doing it, you don't feel you're capable of doing it, then you can, you can, well, a lot of people are, some consulting it out to, I mean, and obviously those people who are technically executing it, they're going to be consulting it out to them. Yeah, but you just hit the nail on the head. Can they, they can't, they're suddenly calling themselves principal no. designers. No, no, no. no, no. You still retain that responsibility of principal designer, but, yeah. you're, but you're asking someone else to assist you with that role. Right. So, yeah. we, so say you say you employed suites to do that, we would do it on your behalf, so it would still be your name on the notification of principal designer. So I still take responsibility? You, you would. And yeah, that's part issue, of the problem. You but you can, can sub-consult it to a specialist. Yeah. And there is, I think, the APS, Association of Project Safety, who we're members of, they are getting a category of, I can't remember what it is, a principal, desi principal designer's advisor or something, so someone who's qualified to advise the principal designer. Right. So um, I get sued and then I have to counter sue them? Probably, yeah, I mean it's messy. It's a route you can go along, but the, the options are either to appoint someone, do it, to sit it as part of your discipline, or to appoint someone separately as the principal designer. Got it. So you've got, they've got two options, but uh, 
that's that's the way they can deal with it. So, as I say, the principal designer should have the health and safety skills and knowledge, not just be a good designer. And the principal designer needs additional skills to say those are the lead designer. So, again, you might be a very good lead designer on the project, you might be leading the design team, but if you haven't got health and safety skills and knowledge, you shouldn't be acting as the principal designer. So the principal designer's duties, they've got to plan, manage and monitor pre-construction stage and coordinate health and safety. What they're trying to do, as I say, is, is get the principal designer involved in the process much earlier on and the obvious person is the lead architect or the lead designer. They're the obvious person to do the job, but as I say, there are difficulties in doing it, especially in the early stages. Once the regulations come into force, it will probably change, but um, there are, it, it, that's why they're trying to get get this introduce this role so the the principal designers involved in the project much earlier on um, the principal designer has to identify and collate the pre-construction information document so there's a pre-construction information document he's got to obtain the information collate the document and make sure it's passed to those who need it I mean that's all things there's a guidance on what should be in there but it is you know access routes um, if there's a location for toilet and well facilities any site rules any permit requirements hazards such as asbestos services, um, contamination, they're all things that should be in that pre-construction information document. They've got to coordinate health and safety during the pre-construction stage and they've got to ensure other designers comply with their duties and cooperate. Um, they have to liaise and communicate with the principal contractor for the duration of the project. So the principal designer should be liaising and communicating with the principal. When the first draft of these regulations came out, <coughs> they were saying that the um, they, they were looking at it very much as though once the design stage finished, the principal designer would cease having an involvement and then it would all be down to the principal contractor to manage everything on site. <coughs> I think they accepted that design continued right through to the completion of construction. So the principal designer has a responsibility to communicate right throughout the construction process with the principal contractor. And the principal designer is now responsible for pre preparing the health and safety file. That's what the CDM coordinator used to do. Now it's a principal designer responsibility. And they have to comply with other designers' obligations they might have. So they've got other designers' obligations. So who can be the principal designer? They've got to have health and safety skills, knowledge and resources. They've got to have control over the pre-construction stage of a project in respect of health and safety but not necessarily the running of the design team, so they've got to manage the health and safety aspects of the design process. And a principal designer can be an organisation or it can be an individual, but they've got to have the skills, knowledge and resources to do it, and they also have to be designers. Um, yeah, it's... <laughs> and the principal designer may have separate design duties, so they can carry out other work to that. Um, Principal design on variation of projects, you mentioned like the refurb, could that be the main contractor as well? Can be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean the principal, especially the smaller projects, it can be, but you should really be appointed in writing to do the two jobs, okay. but they can be, um, I mean anyone can do it because you can be the client, the client can be the principal designer. Yeah. Um, if they don't appoint anyone, they can take those responsibilities on. I do a lot of work for um, developers and they're very much involved in the design process uh, during the early right through the design and construction process and they're ideally placed to be the principal designer they, they actually don't want to do it but they they want to pass it on to someone else but they're ideally placed to do to do that role so the client can take on the role anyone can do it providing they've got the can demonstrate they've got the competence and resources this is just onto the design obligations. I mean, this is just an exact sample of what happens when, when a design goes wrong. That's a, um, a plant room on an exchange conference centre in Bridgewater. Someone climbed down that ladder. He fell down the hole and was killed. Um, and the HSC have fined the designer £180,000 for failing to comply with their design obligations under the CDM regulations. So designers will get fined and they will get prosecuted. I was aware of um, a deep excavation where someone was killed and the HSE had the designers in there. 
I mean, it, you, you think it's just an automatically falls on the contractor, but they had the designers in saying, why didn't you look at alternatives to deep excavations? Why didn't you try to, why did you have deep excavations? Why didn't you try and design them out? So they will go after designers and they will prosecute designers. And those obligations are very, very similar to what they had to do under the old CDM regulations. So designers, their duties are very similar to what they had under CDM 2007. They haven't changed dramatically. Um, a designer is an organisation or individual that proposes or modifies a design. People just think of a designer as the key disciplines, an architect, a structural engineer, m and &E, but there's a whole raft of other people who have design responsibilities. A temporary works um, designer, quantity surveyors, chartered surveyors, um, principal contractor can be a designer, specialist contractors can be designers, and the clients can be designers. Clients who start saying, specifying products and materials, are taking on design responsibilities. So they have to consider um, what the issues are associated with their design and take action to design out those risks or reduce them to an acceptable level. So the designer's responsibilities, I say, I'm not sure how many of you designers, whether you want, I can flick through these last couple of slides. Um, they've got to be aware of their risks and address the general principles of pre prevention. They've got to have the right skills and knowledge they should make sure clients are aware of their responsibilities. What we are saying earlier on, the domestic client, the smaller client, the first person who goes and sees them is the person designing their project, and so they should be making sure they are aware of their obligations under the CDM regulations. They have to cooperate with others with design responsibilities and provide information on risks arising from the design, and they have to coordinate their work with other. So if you get that designer's document that I mentioned earlier on, which is about a 20-page document, um, there are some very useful appendices in that document. The, the designers are supposed to el eliminate, reduce and control risks. They like to call it ERIC because um, they like these acronyms. And they should, in Appendix D, is a list of general principles of prevention, what designers should be doing, what items are they should be looking for and what they should be trying to design out. And in Annex E, there's a red, amber, green guide, red are items that should be distinctly avoided, amber are items that um, should be allowed but could be managed, and green are actions that sh can be encouraged. It's a one page that, it's quite a simple document. If I was a designer, I'd print it out and have it on my wall, and I think it's the sort of thing that as we, um, we as we're taking on the role of principal designer, which is what we will be doing, um, we will be using that as a guide in our in hazard review exercises just to go through the project and look at all the obvious items and to try and design them out. And that is the CITB guide? It's the, it's the guide, if you go on the CITB webpage or the APS webpage or the HSE probably, they've got this guide for the, it's the, gui the gu they've got the gu guide for the five duty holders, it's designers and it's just the de designers guide. Um, and it's quite a clear document, and they say there's one for contractors, one for principal contractors. So it's quite a clear document that um, people can follow. So the principal contractor, um, this, as I say, has always been the case under the old regulations. It now applies to all these small projects. Um, it's quite difficult if you were just, for example, painting in here and having, changing the lights. In theory, you should appoint one company as the principal contractor. And, but it is quite obvious, it's to have one person, one company in charge of health and safety, there's no, no conflict, if someone trips over and foot hurts himself, if someone electrocutes himself, you know, it's one company managing the process and one company taking responsibility for it. I say that hasn't changed, except that only used to apply to projects over 30 days in duration, now it applies to every project. The principal contractor must be appointed by the client, and there should only be one principal contractor for a project at any one time. So I say it's, it's quite obvious, really. Um, the principal contractor has to be competent. They have to be a company, uh, company that can deliver their project in a way that secures health and safety. So they have to be a competent company. They have to be a company that has the necessary skills, knowledge and resources. Again, if I was a client, I'd be making sure they've either been assessed in some way or they've got CHAS registration, their SSIP, or a member of some other safe contractor scheme. And again, they've got they've got a track record, the, the, the work they're carrying out is similar to the work you're asking them to do. You don't ask a ground worker to demolish a factory. Um, so you've got to be getting them, you know, it's got to be someone with the right skills and knowledge of the type of work you're asking them to do. 
and they've got to be aware of what their responsibilities are. Um, I still get principal contractor roles been there for what nearly 20 years now and if a contractor phones up and says what's a construction phase plan or what do I need to put into it to me probably they don't understand what their roles and responsibilities are but as I say there's a whole raft of new people coming into it now so uh, I, I would expect this to start raising its head again so the principal contractor has to prepare this construction phase plan that sets out how work is to be managed safely um, it isn't just what people think is a method statement, it's a construction phase plan. Um, why, why that might be different than a method statement, it sets out things like the management process, who's in charge of health and safety, um, toilet and welfare facilities, security segregation, and that is the document that the client shouldn't allow work to start until that document is in place or relevant documents in place. That once they've got their plan, they shouldn't just stick it on a shelf and forget about it, they've got to implement the plan and ensure cooperation between contractors. They've got to monitor the plan, um, including revising and updating it. There's no point having a site agent on site at the start. He leaves a couple of weeks through the project, and then you, you still have his name down as the emergency coordinator, um, a name person for doing site inductions. You've got to update the plan. They've got to secure the site. It wasn't in the old regulations. It's quite clear they have to secure the site. Um, Again, a greenfield site is probably quite obvious, but if you're working in an occupied building like this, if you're refurbishing this room, you'd have to make sure outside that this is a clearly defined construction area. Somehow make sure that there's a notice up saying construction area, don't enter, put a barrier across it. It's quite clear that it is a construction area in the possession of whoever the principal contractor is um, and lock the door when the site's unattended so people can't just work in there. It's all about, I look at it like it's a question of risk. You're making sure that you're reducing your risk to an acceptable level. And the principal contractor's got to provide welfare facilities for the workforce. They have to induct all the workers and the visitors onto the site, again, what they should be doing. And they've got to liaise with, on design with the principal designer and all designers. And they have to produce information for the health and safety file, which the principal designer's producing. I'll just go through this very quickly. A contractor is what we would probably call a subcontractor. Most people call a subcontractor. It could be a one-man band working on his own. But it's basically, they've got to be responsible for health and safety. They've got to coordinate with the principal contractor. Um, and they have to make sure that the work, their workforce are aware of all the health and safety risks on that project. And they have to coordinate with the designers. So it is, it's a subcontractor has to, if they're working under a main a principal contractor, they have to coordinate with them and comply with their rules and obligations, even if some instances they not, might not necessarily be employed by them directly. They're working on a principal contractor's site and they've got to communicate with them. So workers, I said they've got their guidance, but basically the workforce have a two-way process. There should be a process of consultation up and down the chain. There should be a, co a process of consultation from the client down to the work and, and the principal contractor <coughs> the management team down to the workforce so they should be involved the workforce should be told what's going on and the workforce have to have consultation back up to the management team so they can let the clients know what's going on I know one particular painting contractor Bell a massive national painting contractor they recognized that the timesheet was the best document that or the most used document by their workforce so they they encouraged the workforce they put on the back and encouraged the workforce to um, write on there any concerns they've got on health and safety. It's a document that then goes back to management, which is I thought was quite a useful tool. And they also say the workers should have a health and safety representative. So can the CDM coordinator, where you've got a CDM coordinator or you're working with an existing CDM coordinator um, on your projects or you work with someone regularly or he's appointed on the scheme, can he become the principal designer? Um, there is no requirement for the principal designer to be the lead designer or member of the design team. So you, if you've got your design team, they don't have to be the lead architect or member of the design team. And they have to have the skills, knowledge and resources to fulfil this role. But then it says they should be an integral part of the design team. So if you appoint someone who's not one of the main designers, they still have to be involved in the design process and be involved in the design meetings and the design process and they have to have the technical design knowledge of the construction industry. Basically, um, the designer, the regulation, the role is exactly the same as what the CDM coordinator used to do. 
except um, they now have to be designers or have a design involvement and in our discussions and most people it's probably the use of this word principal designer is the was pro totally the wrong word to use but the HSC I know why the HSC used it but that's what it's they should have used it used continued using CDM coordinator or CDM consultant and everyone would be a lot clearer but uh, they've used this word principal designer which tends to confuse everyone so the principal designers got to manage the pre-construction phase of the project in a very similar way to the CDM coordinator used to do. I'm nearly at the end. Um, we, the health and CDM regulations sit very much alongside the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, so the Health and Safety at Work Act basically means that you have to consider the health and safety of your workforce or anyone who might be affected by the work. And if you don't comply with the Health and Safety at Work Act, it's a criminal act and you cannot insure against it. So you have to be aware that CDM, this is all versions of the CDM regulations, it's very much alongside of the Health and Safety at Work Act. So the client options going forward, um, as I say, from all projects now appointed, now since 6th of April, you have to appoint that principal designer. Um, so you can appoint your old CDM coordinator as a principal designer, but I would recommend um, assisting adding additional duties into that role to assist the client to discharge their duties. To say the client has these obligations to notify the HSE, check the construction phase plan, make sure health and safety is being properly managed, um, and I would be passing those responsibilities onto the principal designer as an additional obligation. This is very much playing with words. You could appoint the CDM coordinator, you could appoint a CDM consultant, so you appoint a CDM consultant. Some people very much like this. Um, so the CDM consultant is assisting the client to discharge their duties, uh, but wrapped up in their schedule of duties is the role of principal designer. So you're saying that you, 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 you're the CDM consultant, but you're undertaking the duties of the principal designer as covered by CDM 2015. So it is very much a, um, it's a play on words. It's not a duty covered by the regulations, but it just gets around this confusion of people sat around a table saying, "Who's the principal design? I'm, I'm the lead architect, um, I'm the, or I'm, I'm the, the lead project or the project manager." And then they go around the table, and introduce themselves, and you get to the principal designer and says, "I'm principal designer." So they all look at each other and think, "Well, who's doing what here?" <coughs> well, if you say I'm the CDM consultant, but I'm discharging the duties of the um, principal designer. It is something that would work, um, but as I say, people are tackling it differently, but a lot of people are going that way. <coughs> a client, you could appoint a CDM consultant to advise on CDM matters, audit compliance, help the client discharge their duties, audit compliance of the others, audit compliance of the principal designer, um, principal contractor and various other people, you could just appoint a consultant to do that. I, it's not a duty under the regulations. I probably wouldn't be doing it unless it was a very large project and then you might be wanting to appoint someone to <coughs> help you discharge your duties and obligations. You can appoint one of the design team to be the principal designer, one of your existing design team, but if they haven't got the health and safety skills, knowledge and resources, they can't do the job and you shouldn't be appointing them and you can't make them do the job. You can appoint one of the design team to be the principal designer but they can have this, uh, if they haven't got the skills, knowledge and resources, they can appoint a sub-consultant to carry out the role on their behalf. Um, that is something that I think that will happen in the future when large jobs are going out. People are going to be putting out um, questionnaires for the main disciplines and the medium-sized architectural practices and people like that who've got no um, in health and safety knowledge and experience, they will be appointing a um, a sub-consultant to work with them so they can provide the service. But um, as you say, I don't per personally like that because who takes the responsibility? It's not clear. Is it the named principal designer or is it the consultant working on their behalf? As a person doing that job, if we were doing it, we would be in the pay when paid situation. We'd have to wait for the architect or lead designer to, to get the work and pay us. And it gets a bit missed. Um, it gets a bit cloudy. The principal contractor can do, be the principal designer. Um, they can take on those responsibilities, but there is then a slight problem of um, a third party checking and making sure they do the job. And what's not listed there is the client can take on the role of principal designer. If they feel they're competent to do the job, they can take on the role of principal, uh, principal designer. 
and they wouldn't have to appoint themselves in writing. So some people are quite able to do it. Well, on the smaller job, I think the one thing you're missing there is that um, uh, my reading of it was that if you're the only designer on the job, you are by default the principal designer. Um, only for domestic. Yeah. yeah, only for domestic. Yeah, yeah. Important point, but yeah, I say we. I, I, to be quite honest, I don't. We don't do that much in the domestic market situation. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. Right. You're yeah. Right. You are right, but it's yeah, yeah. So clients should consider how to address the regulations on existing projects. Um, I would be transferring the CDM coordinator to the principal. De designer if I had one already appointed um, because all the ma main design work has been carried out. <coughs> you've, you've got to co cover that appointment in writing um, and providing the CDM coordinators willing to do that. Um, they, they might not want to do it. Some does, CDM coordinators are saying we're not doing it anymore. Um, and then the client has to consider how they wish to address it on new projects. So you can appoint the CDM coordinator on, on, on any new project coming up. You have to appoint someone as a principal designer. Um, and you have to decide who you're going to appoint and how you're going to address that. And just a bit of advertising splurge there. We, I mean, we're more than happy to come and give anyone advice on the various options and how to cover projects. I mean, I've got a lot of people who've got term contracts, um, hospitals and universities, they've got term contractor. And what I've been saying, rather than look at individual, each treat individual project um, as a separate project requiring construction phase plan, I've been saying produce a pre-construction information document um, and a construction phase plan for all of your standard items that you're doing on the, on the scheme um, and generic items and then that would cover everything they do within the year and then back that up with specific method statements for high risk or unusual operations and therefore as far as I'm concerned providing they assess their competence there would be a notice to the HSC a principal designer would be appointed they have a construction phase plan in place so they can't be criticized they're complying with the requirements of the regulations but there is this whole raft of projects that people didn't used to consider were covered by the regulations but are now covered so I mean this is just uh, clients and principal designers have to be aware of the implications of these regulations and the safety risks. The role of the principal contractor hasn't changed dramatically, the role of designers hasn't changed dramatically, but the client's obligations have changed and principal designers have changed. And there's, that's just rounded off by a pretty map of all our offices throughout the world. And that's it. Thank you, Thank you Derek.